Good Afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic Sea Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by coronatools.com, the nation's leader in garden and landscaping tools. Listeners of The Organic View can receive 20% off their coronatools.com purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. And don't forget to check out our contest section. On today's show, Tom and I are going to talk about Professor Dave Goulson's open letter the UK's pesticide ban, and more research about the songbird decline due to neonicotinoid exposure. So I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald. Hello, Tom. Hello, June. We're back into winter. We had about four or five inches of snow Wednesday evening, and it hasn't melted off yet, so back into winter. Tom, how did the bees cope with this drastic change in weather? Really, uh, unless it comes suddenly, you know, if the temperature drops suddenly when they're out in the field or something like that, the bees really have adapted to the cold temperatures and the fluctuation in temperatures very well. They started out as a tropical species and began working their way north, and they developed the ability to generate heat to maintain a survival temperature in their in the cluster. And because of that, they've been able to to migrate into temperate climates. So on a cold day like this, the bees are in the hive, and if it's, say, in the 40s, they may not be flying, but they're moving around inside the hive. It's warm enough that they can move around. If it gets above, oh, 50 or 55, then they'll begin to fly. So they've adapted very well to this, and they can survive very deep temperature uh, drops in the winter quite successfully if the colony is healthy and has a good population. Thanks, Tom. Before we begin, I just want to ask you a question about your classes. You were yet again teaching new beekeepers. How many years have you been doing this, and what are some of the most common questions the new hobbyists are asking you? This, I just did one of the sections that I teach this past Tuesday, and I think this is year number 19. Initially, we uh, we had a significant decline in the number of beekeepers because of the varroa mite arriving in Boulder County. That happened in 1995. They showed up in the U.S. in about 1987 or 88. And uh, so the beekeeping class was designed to help new beekeepers have a good start, to give them the foundation. And we recognized at the beginning that not all of those people would become beekeepers or perhaps should become beekeepers. And so we, uh, we coined the concept of beekeeping ambassadors. So many of the people who've graduated from these classes who didn't go into beekeeping themselves can speak knowledgeably about some of the problems that we face and some of the things that uh, common questions that people ask about bees. And to answer your question, <laughs> over 19 years, I've had every question imaginable. Some things that you would be, you would think would be very simple and, and obvious, uh, puzzle new beekeepers, other things that are fairly complicated they seem to grasp quite quickly you you just never know and every class is a little different i'm sure the teachers out there uh understand what it's like we're dealing with almost exclusively adults but many of them come come to the classes just filled with all kinds of questions bees are fascinating species and this is a a unique window into the natural world. So it opens the opportunity for all kinds of questions. I guess I don't have an answer to your question. It could be almost anything imaginable. Thank you, Tom. 
The reason that I asked is because we receive so many questions about beekeeping practices as well as the impact of neonicotinoids, which is a very harsh reality for many people that are just learning about them. And this ties into our first topic, which is Professor Dave Goulson's open letter to policymakers and regulators. I just want to read a few sentences from it. He wrote, neonicotinoids are the most widely used insecticides in the world, being applied to a broad range of food, energy, and ornamental crops, and used in domestic pest control. They are neurotoxins with very high toxicity to insects, a group of organisms that contains the majority of the described life on Earth, and which includes numerous species of vital importance to humans, such as pollinators and predators of pests. Neonicotinoids have proved to be highly persistent in the environment, such that significant residues are commonly found in soils, wildflowers, streams, and lakes. For example, a recent study in the journal Science found neonicotinoids in 75% of honey samples collected from around the world. Hundreds of independent scientific studies have been performed to assess their impacts on beneficial organisms such as bees, aquatic insects, butterflies, and predatory beetles. And just reading that, that opening statement, it's mind-blowing. It's surreal that this is what is going on with our environment. It's surreal that the legislators are basically doing nothing and have been doing nothing for decades. It's surreal that so many scientists have conducted independent, peer-reviewed and published research that proves that the global decline of our pollinators is caused by the use, the widespread use of neonicotinoids. And Professor Golson has made a plea to policymakers and regulators. This plea is actually found on surveymonkey.co.uk and a copy of it, a link to it rather, will be made available on theorganicview.com in the companion article to this interview. Folks, if you want to do something, please, by all means, urge your elected officials, urge the people that can actually do something about this, the regulators, urge them to come on board and join together and do something about these pesticides. They must be banned. Professor Goulson is one of the most articulate voices that we have, and he's shown an inordinate amount of courage in speaking out. And there are many uh, YouTube videos of talks that he's made, and I would encourage the listeners to look him up and listen to some of the things that he's had to say. This open letter is very interesting because he's reaching out to his fellow scientists and asking them to sign on to a letter calling for the ban of these neonicotinoids. And I hope that we can get Dave on the program in the near future so that he can bring us up to date on just how many scientists have signed so far. This, uh, this is a tremendous problem, and I think the tide is shifting. We're beginning to see some of the regulatory agencies come to their senses, um, the UK is about to ban all neonicotinoids. The same thing is likely to happen at the hands of the European Union, and France is considering bans. So we're beginning to see some countries starting to recognize the severity of the problem. Here in the United States, it's just the opposite, and the EPA and the UPA, USDA have their heads in the sand or somewhere else where the sun doesn't shine, and we've heard nothing from them. And in fact, what they've done just recently, they announced that the review of the neonicotinoids would be put out another two years. Originally, they were supposed to have completed these reviews 
two or three years ago. Now they're talking about 2019, and by the time we get to 2019, I have no doubt that they'll put it off again. If I were in the management of the EPA, I would see this as absolute incompetence, but it, you can't blame it on the workers because it's the management that's incompetent. To keep putting these things off in the face of what probably is the most massive environmental poisoning we've ever experienced. Someone needs to step in and start taking control, and I think the only... The only uh, avenue we have is the public. The public has to become irate because the system is not going to correct itself. The, the politicians have shown that they have no courage, that they're not going to do anything. And it's left to the public to address these crimes against the environment and crimes against humanity. It is. And the fact that we have so much research... And we see so many people that are being paid by industry to try to dispute that independently conducted, peer-reviewed research is just ridiculous. But once again, this is the battle. That brings us into the next topic, which is in regards to the UK support of the neonicotinoid pesticide ban, which is very surprising, don't you think, Tom? Well, it is surprising because up until just recently, the UK was uh, in the corner of the chemical companies. They were arguing against any kinds of bans or controls, and that's that's one of the the things that represents a, a change in the tide. They now recognize what the disaster, the magnitude of the disaster. I think many of them have been influenced by the study that came out of Germany just recently where they had been assessing the the uh, weight of flying insects over a period of 27 years and they've seen that there's been a 76% decline. I think that was a wake-up call. We, uh, we recently have seen some... Uh, news from Saskatchewan about the effect that these neonicotinoids on seeds used as seed coatings, the effect that they have on birds and their ability to migrate and orient, very similar to what we saw in the honeybees. So the news is uh, is beginning to reveal the disaster. And I think, uh, except in the United States, they all seem to be responding. Yes, the United States, unfortunately and pathetically, is not taking the lead. That's shocking within itself. But until people start speaking up, until people start doing what they should be doing, which is to understand what the research entails, look to people like Professor Dave Goulston, all the research that he's conducted, as well as countless other scientists. We've interviewed so many scientists on this program, and... Once again, the science does not lie. The science shows what is happening to these indicator species, and unfortunately, folks, what happens to them inevitably will happen to us. Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Joan, and once again, thanks to all the listeners who tune in to hear what we have to say. And um, We need the listeners. We need them to become more active and and educate themselves so that they know as much or more than we do. And this is our this is our podium. Once a week, we we do the best we can. And I appreciate you providing that venue. Thanks, Tom. And folks, if you have any questions, please reach out to us at questions at theorganicview.com. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon.